Total crown fire. Rolling the top, pushing me off this back side. A lot of heat. What you just watched is something that happens every year, mostly during the summer months in the United States, and they're caused by lightning fires. And that's Mother Nature at work. And in 1934, T.B. Pearson, a regional forester, had an idea to use aerial delivered firefighters to quickly respond to forest fires and put them out before they became large and out of control. In 1935, another regional forester by the name of Evan Kelly dismissed this idea. And this is what he had to say. In the first place, the best information I can get from experienced flyers is that all parachute jumpers are more or less crazy, just a little bit unbalanced, otherwise they wouldn't engage in such hazardous undertaking. That next year, David Godwin, assistant fire chief and head of this program at the time, finally made it all happen in Winthrop, Washington, and that was a birthplace of smoke jumping. That following year, uh, the fire service looked to the professionals, and that was the Eagle Parachute Company at Lancaster, Pennsylvania. These folks came to Winthrop, Washington to show them that you can jump out of a plane with a parachute, it was made of silk, you can float down to the ground and go to work. They did 58 successful practice jumps that fall. That next year, there were two test bases, one in Montana and the other in Winthrop, Washington. On July 12, 1940, Rufus Robinson and Earl Cooley were dispatched from Montana to the Nez Pierce National Forest in Idaho. That day they made history. They were able to parachute safely out of a plane, float down to the ground, put the fire out, pack up all the gear, get back to base, and they're ready to go again. Weeks later, August 10, 1940, Francis Slufkin and Glenn Smith had their first jump. That year, they made a total of nine successful jumps with an estimated cost savings of around $30,000. This was around three times the amount of get this whole program up and running at that time. The parachute during that era was getting a lot of attention. Major General William C. Lee, uh, later to be known as the Godfather of Airborne, and a few of his staff officers from the Army came to Montana, looked at the program, took it back to Fort Benning, Georgia, and again, the parachute made history years later, the night of June 5th, 1944, hours before the D-Day invasion, World War II. Since the beginning of this program, there has been only 5,812 aerial delivered firefighters that have come past to become better known as a smoke jumper. These folks come from all walks of life. They are teachers, professors, they are farmers, ranchers, uh, military folks, professional athletes, musicians, and the list goes on and on and on. Every year, approximately 450 jumpers are available ready to go throughout the U.S. seven days a week with a total of nine bases at a moment's notice. Some of these bases can be off the ground in even under 10 minutes or less. Now, I want you to think about that for a second, 10 minutes or less. When they get a call, they're able to don their gear, 75 to 85 pounds worth of jump gear, protective equipment, go through their safety checks, board the plane, taxi down the runway, and take off to a forest fire or even a rescue mission. I know myself, just to get out of bed, I hit that snooze alarm a few times, so you can just imagine how fast these folks get suited up and they could head to a forest fire. And it's all about initial attack. Again, these folks are designed and trained to get to a forest fire as fast as they can and put it out before it grows into a monster. This is an example of uh, early stages of a lightning fire, and this is kind of what it looks like, especially on the of the West Coast and on certain states. And uh, this is what we try to prevent in this next little video clip. Uh, we want to get them small before they turn into this. This is a, a very angry fire. Uh, some of these, uh, these plumes, which we call, can um, make their own lightning, rain, high wind, so you can see the amount of more destruction 
uh, life and property once a fire gets a hold and the amount of acres that they can burn. Some of these fires can even burn an entire fire season, months. They can even winter, and in the next year, spring pops up, some of these fires can still be underground. So it's pretty amazing what Mother Nature can do. Now think of the, the program as problem solvers. These folks, again, are trained. Uh, they're fully self-contained. Once they leave that plane, they can be on the ground for 48 hours, and they don't need anything. They just need a mission. What are we gonna do? Whether it be a fire or even a rescue mission. So picture the plane being a shopping cart. We all go shopping, you load up your cart. So think of that plane has all the tools, all the food, everything they need, even rescue equipment if someone's hurt out in the forest. So once these folks get down on the ground, their main objective is most of the time is gonna be a forest fire. And this is where it gets interesting. So when we land, uh, we're gonna encircle that fire and we cut a fire line. And that what we're gonna do is we're taking the food away from the fire, so trees, uh, the brush, the light, fuels, anything that can burn, we're gonna take it down to mineral soil, which is the dirt. Just like you make your campfire, you put a little ring around it, we're gonna do that on a larger scale. Now it depends on the size of the fire. This can take anywhere from a few minutes, hours, or even days, depending how fast we get there to put this fire out. And again, once these folks are on the ground, they can stay up to 14 days and then they'll get resupplied with food and supplies. So this is a technology part of um, what I have a passion for. This is basically my home for those 40 hours or even 14 days. This is a pack that turns into a backpack, goes on my back, and these are the supplies that I have. So I have my small kitchen in there and a lot of high-end technology that I'm using today that I purchased out of my own pocket because we provide a, a, a service to the people and I wanna be at that, that highest level. One of the most important tools in here is my communications and even a, a handheld weather station that pretty much the size of my clicker here. And I can record weather from down to every two seconds if I want to. Um, I usually record at every 30 minutes. Protocol's an hour and I take it to every 30 minutes. And that'll build a graph. You know, how many days on that fire that I'm staying It'll spit out at any time I want what's going on in the weather. So that could tell me if there's bad weather coming in, maybe possible of, of thunder sails, um, if the relative humidities went really down, really low, and that means you're putting a lot of chapstick on, your lips are cracking, your hands are cracking, that means high fire threat for us. So this is a lot of the technology that I help um, outsource. I've even helped design and redesign a lot of this uh, with the fire service. Um, for the last two decades. So this is where all the fun starts. This is a pack that weighed uh, 154.8 pounds, plus or minus pretty much 100% of my body weight. And a lot of people ask, you know, what jump, what do you, what jump, what do you guys do and how do you train and uh, do you guys really do anything out there? So remember when we jumped out of that plane, we had our groceries, it's all gotta go somewhere. And this goes in our pack out bag. And this is where a lot of our design comes in. Every base since 1939 has a full commercial sew room. So the folks at the smoke jumper level um, become master riggers and senior riggers, and they go through a series of tests and practicals and years of hard work to make these packs for us, and they're perfect. Uh, the seams, um, all the buckles, everything that we outsource is absolutely to the highest perfection, because you can imagine if we're out there and uh, this pack breaks, where am I gonna put 154 pounds? <laughs> I gotta get back to the base and be ready to go again. So you can see the amount of technology that this has been handed down since 1939, and we keep making it better and better and better. So think of the textiles on the back of that pack there as kind of a recipe. We're always looking for those better ingredients to make our gear all the time. In rookie training, to become a smoke jumper to date, you're around four to six weeks, uh, depending on weather. And these are one of the tests that you're gonna have to perform, is in, when you're on the phone calling these trainers that you wanna apply to become an aerial delivered firefighter, they tell you some of the training that you're gonna have to go through, and you have to do 110 pounds, flat three miles in under 90 minutes. And the trainers will tell you that is an easy test. And you kinda scratch your head and turn your head like a dog when you hear a funny sound, like an easy test. You know, you're thinking these guys are arrogant, and they're not arrogant, they're confident. 
This is over 75 years of excellence in the JUMP program, and these folks are there to give you the right tools to succeed. And as you can see, 154 pounds, I couldn't even get off the ground that day, and if I didn't have that training, I'd probably still be sitting there today, <laughs> hanging out. So a very important uh, part of the JUMP program. A lot of people ask, you know, during my fire career, we give a lot of tours being a firefighter from um, the local firehouses to even where I'm at now as an aerial delivered firefighter. They want to come and visit the base, and they ask, why would you jump out of a perfectly good airplane? And if I just had half a cent of all the times I've been asked that, and this is a bad joke, but I always tell them, have you seen our planes and met our pilots? And people look at you, and I say, no, it's, it's a joke. Uh, our pilots and our planes are not some of the best in the world or the best in the world. They fly at times in horrible weather. They get us there safely. We jump out and at times even pick us up. And you can imagine some of the terrain that they fly in to get us to put these fires out. So they are pure excellence. This slide here, 1987, 14 years old, and I got to see some of these pilots in action. They were not smoke jumper pilots, but they were the air tanker pilots and helicopter pilots that you see on national news when you see big fires. Um, they drop the retardant, you see the red colored stuff come out of the plane, and you see the helicopters with buckets hanging below them. And those folks are working with the folks on the ground. And again, imagine, I'm 14 years old, I'm on top of my roof, we just moved here um, in Southern California, and this is what I saw. You can imagine my brain was just, I'm short-circuiting. I mean, I got smoke coming in my ears. What's going on here? My dad's hooking up the hose. We got water on the roof. People are leaving. People are getting evacuated. There's planes above you. Dogs barking. Dogs running down the street. And pure chaos. And here comes these firefighters. They're calm. They're going to work. And that just made me scratch my head. I'm 14 years old, and I'm on the top of the roof of the house. And you feel the heat. You can see the distance um, in this picture, and the amount of heat that was on my face was pretty impressive as the wind would change. And I wanted to be part of something. Uh, you know, that picture there doesn't say that I wanted to be a fireman. Um, here's another shot here looking west. I wanted to provide a service. I didn't know what that was. At 17 years old, I applied to become a volunteer firefighter uh, with the Riverside County Fire Department out of Minifee, California. And at the time, you know, in high school, you're getting teased, and people ask you, volunteer? You you're not getting paid? Why do you want to do that? I said, well, when you figure that out, let's talk. <laughs> I wanted to be part of something. So at that time, at 17 years old, um, I came in the fire department, and I had great mentors, great captains, and they help you, uh, they give you the tools to pursue your dream. And to date, I have uh, made various and years and years of solutions in the wildland fire community from technology and design. Um, I've been told there is gear out there that, no, you can't, you can't make something new. That doesn't work. You can't design this. You can't do that. And I said, can't doesn't compute to me. I don't know what that means. Um, and I proved it. I went out there and redesigned equipment that folks right now are probably on duty using stuff that I've helped. And that's part of a, a farm and making that difference, um, which is very important to me. Uh, since that time today, like I said, I've written a book, uh, made many solutions, and it's all about making a difference. And uh, a lot of people ask, you know, you don't have a degree in engineering. You don't have a degree in this. You don't have a degree in that. And I said, you're right. I got a degree in passion. Do you got that one? <laughs> So, again, people look at you and they, they tilt their head like a, a dog when they hear a siren. And, uh, and a lot of people ask me, well, how, do you, how, did you, how do you redesign something? How did you do that? And I say, well, just like you asked me, I ask. I find these CEOs of these, pres of these companies, the VPs, uh, the lead designers. I meet them at uh, expos and events. I shake their hand. I show them my designs, I show them my passion, I show them that degree in passion, and we do it. We've done it after project, after project, after project, and I'm not done yet. We just, we started off with a scratch, small hammer making a dent, and recently I bought a big hammer to make big dents. So that, that is our, <laughs> what we're doing now. And uh, again, it's all about making that difference. Uh, 75 years of excellence in the JUMP program, and firefighters throughout the world, and uh, it just shows what you can do, 
if you have that degree in passion, it, it can happen. What is your difference going to be?